Hello and welcome to Coil Half and to our third uh, series or our third talk in our Creole and Patois series and today I'm speaking to David Austin who has written Dread Poetry and Freedom, Linton Quasi Johnson and The Unfinished Revolution that's come out from Pluto Press who very kindly are sponsoring this event. Uh, David is a writer, editor and radio broadcaster and amongst other things he has uh, done documentaries on CLR James and on Franz Fanon who I'm sure will feature fairly heavily in today's talk. Uh, David, thank you very much for being here. Oh, my sincere pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, I think what I'd like to start by asking is why Linton Quasi Johnson? Why have you written a book about him? How did you come to him? And, uh, and what prompted you to go as far as writing, writing this book? Hey, well, first, thanks, thanks for having me here. And um, it's like a real pleasure. And um, uh, it's always uh, something special, actually, to talk about the work that you do, and also, in particular, in this case, about a poet whose work I've admired and followed for some years now. And there, you know, it began when a friend, Richard Eiten, um, uh, from Montreal, used to teach at Northwestern University in Chicago and also at the University of Toronto, um, of Jamaican and Vincentian origin. We used to do a radio program together called Soul Perspective. Um, at a community radio station here in Montreal. And one day he asked me if I've heard of Linton Crazy Johnson before. And I told him, no, I hadn't, and he just couldn't believe it. Right? He was just completely incredulous. And uh, um, he brought me at one point the cassette tape. I think I'm pretty sure it was um, Forces of Victory, which is the one that has the recording of Sonny's letter, among other things. Uh, and it was either that or Dread Beat and Blood. This, Actually, interesting that the two of them are conflated in my head, but um, I just remember listening and feeling, well, oh, what, what the hell is this? You know, I've never heard anything like this, both poetically, but also musically, because this is a very different reggae aesthetic also. And um, I've just been following his poetry since. You know, I was a student at the time, an undergraduate student, and we were doing this radio program. I probably played his music poetry too often. You know, to the point where people just were, were maxed out. Um, I started writing about him, you know, first for the school newspaper and then for some other, you know, magazines in the Canadian context in Toronto and Montreal. And so I've been following his work since. Now, writing the book was another thing. So I used to be a community organizer and a youth worker. That's what I did for many years before I started teaching in, in college and university. And um, you know, I left that job in 2001 for one organization that I was working for. And, you know, it was a very difficult three years, very intense working 16 hours a day, six, seven days a week. And I was close to burnout. And it also coincided with, you know, the organization going through some serious challenges, which reflected the difficulties and challenges that were happening in that particular community. And I won't go into all the details of that. Right? So when I left the job, I was in between jobs, let's say, like September, August, September 2001. But the last thing I did was I traveled to South Africa with a group of teenagers for the World Conference Against Racism. And they were grouped with a group of teenagers from Johannesburg and Soweto. And we came back September 10th, drove through New York, remember passing the Twin Towers on the way back to Montreal and the kids were some of the kids were militantly arguing that we should stay overnight so they could shop and whatever else because we were already in New York. And we said no. And um, the following morning, it was September 11th. You know, I received that phone call. Um, watched the Twin Towers, you know, falling to pieces. That same week, I discovered I was going to be a dad for the first time. That my daughter was going to come into this world. And I was also like in my own world, trying to think of like, what next? You know, what's my, you know, I just left this job that I invested my blood, sweat and tears for, for three intense years. And I began to think about the world that my daughter was gonna come into also. So when I asked that question of what next, what kind of world, and what is this thing called social change, which is precisely what we were trying to do in the community that I was working at the time, right? my response to those questions that were in my own head was to kind of write through it. And it just naturally 
came through this poet, Lyndon Crazy Johnson, but also the political and aesthetic artistic tradition that had shaped him. So the original manuscript was, I think I told you this when we were talking the other day, was close to 700 pages. It's almost as if like I was cathartically getting up everything, every idea, every thought I'd ever had in my head and putting it on paper. And then, you know, it sat there for years, almost as if it, it had served its purpose as far as me writing it. And then um, through a series of circumstances, you know, which, huh, which forced me to invoke the name of a friend who passed away just a few days ago, this week, a very close friend. Um, Aziz Chowdhury, <laughs> he introduced me to Dave Shulman, who's the one of the editors at Pluto. And we began a conversation about publishing this manuscript. And that's where it began in terms of Pluto being the publisher and it being the version of the manuscript that is. But, you know, it was long and in many ways unwieldy. And also, when I went to when I went back to it, you know, so my daughter is 19 now, right? So the book was published in 2018. So 17 years, 16 years after it was written, I was revisiting it, and um, I of course realized that so much had been written about Linton Crazy Johnson, a couple of PhD theses which invoked his work substantially, um, and a lot of articles which were non-existent 15 years before. So I had to revisit the book, revisit his work, revisit the literature about his book, about his work, sorry. But also I began teaching him in the college where I teach. I teach at a college called John Abbott College. Um, that's one of the places where I teach. Well, that's the main place where I teach. I also teach at in the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. So in teaching Linton Crazy Johnson in a course on poetry and social change, and that dialogue and dynamic that you have with your students, I realized that this initial draft was somewhat inadequate. And whereas, you know, I was emphasizing the politics of his poetry, right? I hadn't treated the aesthetics, the poetry as poetry with the attention it deserved. And um, so the final version of the book is actually a very different book than the initial version. In fact, it's, there's some exceptions in some, 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 cha some, some chapters. It's actually not the same book. Um, uh, but that's the story, you know, inspired in large part by all that confluence of circumstances, including the fact that I was going to be a parent and was, you know, posing, posing that question to myself, but, you know, for my, for my not yet existent child. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, it's really interesting that you uh, talk about, um, you know, going back and revisiting the kind of literary side of, of Linda Quest Johnson as opposed to the political side. Um, because I, uh, for those that don't know, which is I assume everyone, I wrote my university undergraduate dissertation mm -hmm. on Linda Quest Johnson um, and about reactionary political violence. And I was, um, you know, swamped with uh kind of things about his um kind of poetry but actually found really little using him as source material for a political discussion um but obviously as you say sort of the the, the sort of conversation around social change that you're teaching and, and uh is kind of just inherent to his work is is sort of so there um i'm really interested because obviously a film that you reference a lot in the book is uh, is Dread Beat of Blood, um, which is a film that sort of follows him. It's, I think, available for rent on BFI Player for, for a pound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And in that, he goes to Tulse Hill School, which is where he went to school. Mm -hmm. He reads a poem to his students, and then he asks if they have any questions, and they kind of sit there in silence, and they're very kind of... Um, I don't know if they're bored or in awe or, you know, what, what it might be, probably somewhere in between. How do your students now respond to, to being taught his work? That's an interesting question. Um, I would say very well. You know, so I teach his poetry within the context of a coach, in the context of a conversation around what poetry is and what poetry does in general, right? So in that sense, 
like in the book in many ways, his poetry becomes that example. So we're thinking about how, you know, we talk about how, well, first we talk about canonical poetry and, you know, the problematics associated with canonical poetry and how there are other forms of poetry that don't meet, that, like the, you know, the, you know, the, you know that don't, that don't, are not in concert with the canon, right? But because they're not, are creative forms of expression that do all these other things. Right? And we ask, what does it mean to be a canonical poet? Was Shakespeare canonical as a poet and, 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 and playwright? And of course not, right? He was like, he was using unconventional, unconventional language. He was manipulating the language to meet his creative needs. Um, he was inventing words, right? And even, even in terms of just strict spelling, right? On the same, in the same, in, a, in any one particular play, the same word with the same meaning could be spelled different ways, right? So in other words, the English language was much more malleable in that context, right? Than it is today with all the rules around grammar and spelling, right? Linton Crazy Johnson and, and the genre of poetry, so-called dub poetry, and, I, and you know, I know he's not always fond of the word, and I'm not particularly fond of it either, right? But the kind of poetry written in Jamaica's national language, because it's not so, you know, firmly sort of enshrined and ossified, right? It allows for a certain level of linguistic creativity, right? Which when we talk to them, when I talk to my students about, you know, canons and talk about, about Shakespeare, what Shakespeare was doing, right? In many respects, right? What Linton Crazy Johnson is doing in his time with poetry is quite similar, not bound by the strictures of the English language as it is today. Right? So we talk about language, we talk about canons being a reflection of power, right? And being a reflection of nationalism and national identity, which then subsumes the identities of other people that are also citizens of that nation state, right? To this particular version of what it means to be English in this case. Um, uh, and so in other words, what I try to do is to get them thinking about questions in relation to politics, identity, and aesthetics through Linton Crazy Johnson's poetry and some of the other material that they read in relation to our own context. You know, we also talked about, because we also, I also teach a little bit in the same course um, of Cesare's poetry and also um, Mahmoud Darwish, a famous Palestinian poet, right? And, and you know, and, and po so what does it mean to be reading a, a poem in translation, you know, what is gained as the, you know, the translator's interpretation and what is, what is translate, translator's interpretation as a creative exercise and what is lost, right? You know, how do you deal with all these poetic devices like, you know, assonance and consonants, right? The rhyming, when you, when you, when you talk about a completely different language, maybe you can get away with it with Italian and Spanish, but like, you know, to a, to a certain extent, mm. so English and French, very different. Arabic, in English, what do you even begin to do with that, right? And then you look at, well, Jamaica's patois, right? You know, is, you know, linguistically close to English for obvious historical reasons, but it is another language, right? That in terms of its grammatical structure, right? In terms of its deep structure is much closer to various African languages, particularly part of the Tuyasanti group, which, you know, is associated with Ghana, Burkina Faso, Togo and um, uh, Ivory Coast to a certain extent, but particularly Ghana, right? Which is where a large number of Africans who were enslaved in Jamaica came from, at least uh, in, at a particular period. And so it became the dominant linguistic group. So we think through and talk about all of these things in terms of language, poetics. I don't know where I cut off for you, but you cut off at- um... T.S. Eliot, I think. No, a little bit before that, I think. Oh, but really? it just to bring up to us, Elliot. Is this still recording? Let me just double check. This is still recording. So, yeah, this is still recording. So, it says recording on my end. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, where do you think I got cut off then? Um, you were speaking about. Um, I think you were about. Well, in my mind, we were going to go on to sort of like colonial language standards. So, you're mm -hmm. speaking about how it is a language. It's a different language. It's similar to the Tuya Sante languages. Okay. Mainly related to Ghana. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's when it's sort of okay so can we say that we did, did i more or less sort of finish that part or we could yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so, so okay. the last the last full clip the last full statement you make is that the twir sante languages are most commonly associated with ghana and then you went around sort of burkina faso ivory coast and then but mainly ghana okay, so and then okay. you moved on and then it cut okay 
All right, so I, I think the thing, next thing I was about to jump to was T.S. Eliot, a language. Yeah, 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 good. Okay, perfect, okay. Thank you all my questions, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I, did, I, did, I did warn you. <laughs> much easier to, to, to do it this way around, so I don't have to preempt anything. Um, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, go for it, go for it. So in that course, we also talk about, we also invoke Kemal Brathwaite's notion of nation language and think about what that means both in the you know both in the Jamaican context and other contexts to a certain extent, but especially in the Jamaican context. And you know, it was Kamau, um, may he rest in peace, he passed away um, last year almost at 90, one of the great poets um, writing in who to write in the English language. Um, I often see him in some ways as kind of Derek Walcott's alter ego in some respects. Um, another conversation. Uh, but you know. Kamal Brathwaite was also a critic, you know, a literary critic. And he was the first person that I read, at least, that helped me think about the significance of T.S. Eliot and why T.S. Eliot is such an important fixture in Caribbean poetry, much like Shakespeare, but not to the same extent. And for Kamal Brathwaite, T.S. Eliot introduced what Brathwaite referred to as a conversational tone to English slash British poetry. Right, so breaking with in, in his own way with the iambic pentameter and introducing this kind of almost casual, normatively sort of talkative, conversational form of poetry, which, when you think about Jamaica's national language of the various Creoles across the Caribbean, they're very poetic and lend themselves to writing poetry. So the leap, there's no big leap from conversation to 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 actual writing poetry. Just have to listen to Louise Bennett or Mike, Michael Smith, the great poet from Jamaica too. Um, you know, it's almost like you're, you're, you're sort of privy to a conversation, but it's poet, poetic slash, you know, everyday language. Um, but, I, but then Kamal Brathwaite also said something else that's very interesting about T.S. Eliot, is that that conversational tone and its rhythmic patterns was rooted in where T.S. Eliot was from. And my students are usually surprised to hear that T.S. Eliot was not English, right? There's this assumption that he was English because he, he was such an English nationalist, right? But of course, T.S. Eliot was American, he was from Missouri, right? So for Kamal Brathwaite, he suggested that, that you know, that T.S. Eliot, right, coming from Missouri, right, a blue state, introduced the blues aesthetic to English poetry. That is really interesting because one of the things that I've always thought, and I, I, I make this point in, in another book, uh, Fear, of a Black Liberation, Fear of a Black Nation, which, which came out in 2013, is that, and I just sort of say it in passing, it's something I think is worth developing. You know, when you think about the mass migration of people from the Caribbean to England, beginning in the post-Second World War period, right? What they were doing in many ways in terms of language, in terms of culture, aesthetics, even food, all of those things you put them together. And this is going to sound very strange, but they were Americanizing England. When I say Americanizing, I mean the broad sense of the Americas. I don't mean the United States. I mean, you know, the Caribbean is part of the Americas. And they were bringing those aesthetics to England. It came in the form of language. It came in the form of, you know, culture. And absolutely, of course, literature, literature too, but of course the big form in which it came, which was immensely influential on Linton Kwesi Johnson, is through music. First with ska, I think of uh, Millie Smalls, her, you know, big hit, is it 1964, 65, My Boy Lollipop, right? International hit around the world, took England by storm. But then there were these artists like Prince, Prince Buster, King Stitt, Uroy, Iroy. You know, and your know, Prince Buster was also like, you know, you know, he was part of the kind of ska era, era that then transitioned into, into reggae. You know, people have forgotten, or it's not perhaps been properly significantly emphasized, although I know there's a lot of work being done in England, documentaries, exhibitions, etc. But the impact of Jamaican music on English society, and not only because there was a a receptive Caribbean population in England, right? We're talking about ordinary white folks, 
white English folks who were looking for something different. They were looking to make a break with traditional English society. Right? And the Caribbean offered that break for them. So you see these images, and Prince Buster talked about it in one of those documentaries, I think it's with the BBC that was done some years ago, of him getting off the plane. And there are all of these people, a sea of people, mostly women, white English women, and they're screaming and shouting. It looks like, a, looks like the Beatles, like you know, the crowd chasing the Beatles. Right, and that's what that music meant in that moment. And I think you know, so so Linton Crazy Johnson, right, who is Jamaican, born in Clarendon, moves to England in 1963. He's 11 years old, right. He encounters the aesthetic of reggae music in England, not in Jamaica, and he becomes a connoisseur of sort of sorts of reggae music in England, in Brixton, South London, right? not, in, not, not, not first in Jamaica. So, you know, I think all of this is because like, your initial question, if we could go back to your initial question, like in terms of teaching, right? Is yeah. um, this is really fascinating for students, right? Because it's like, it's a world that they do not have access to, right? And it also, when you think about, so we try and relate it to like contemporary questions and and those same dynamics in the Canadian context, in the North American context, right? Our conception of English society, right, becomes radically altered when we look at it through the prism of migration, literature, and music. And the same is also true of the society that I'm a part of. I live in Montreal, right, and living in Canada. The same is true here, too. I just want to say one other thing about um, I'll just say this very quickly. So I mentioned Richard Eiden, who passed away some years ago, and he, he introduced me to Linton Crazy Johnson's poetry. The reason why it resonated with me so much, one of the reasons, is because I grew up in England for the first 10 years of my life. You wouldn't know it from how I speak, but the first 10 years of my life was spent in South London, um, you know, Brixton. You know, we would visit Brixton on the weekends, but of course, Peckham is very close to Brixton, not very far away. Um, I grew up I grew up in Peckham. In fact, I grew up on the Peckham estate for the first nine years of my life. Um, so listening to Linton Crazy Johnson, there was something that was like just substantively and aesthetically felt really familiar. Absolutely. I mean, there's just, there's so much in there to, to get into. Um, but just to return to T.S. To Eliot and to Kamal mm -hmm. as well. Um, I think one of the things, that, because particularly the focus on language, is that Kamal Brathwaite, when he talks about nation language, um, talks about sort of rejecting kind of colonial standards of language uh, and sort of rejecting, um, uh, yeah, I suppose what one might expect uh, an English language poet to be, but also embracing uh, the kind of supposed inherent musicality in Caribbean languages. And I think he called them tidalectics, if that's, mm -hmm. if that's, that's right. right. That's um, right. And um, this is sort of inherent then in Johnson's work is that by writing in Patois, you are embedding resistance into the language. So you're not just, you know, the subject matter has this political element to it, but actually there's this resistance in, in it, you know, built into the structure of the poem. Um, which I think is, um, you know, <laughs> I don't know what to say. This is, um, no, it's like, it's, it's about resistance, you know, and is this he, is the uh, square root of it, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Is what yeah. it comes down to is it, is, is it, it was, it takes it down to an essence, um, that you can't move from. You can misunderstand. You can disagree with the political perspective. You can you can hate the guy, but actually, the language that you're forced to read the poem in, or the language that you're forced to hear the poem in, has resistance in it as well. And that, I suppose, is what's inescapable about it. Absolutely. And and uh, Edouard Glisson referred to it as natural poetics. So you know, it's like the the, the it's, a, it's a natural, authentic form of expression in terms of both language culture and message. And you know, that is why, because as you know, Linton Crazy Johnson has released several albums without his poetry, right? It's embedded in the music itself. 
which mirrors the, 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 the poetry. It's embedded in the language of the poetry in terms of just language as language, you know, and um, you know, there's a way we can talk about how, for example, Derrida talks about, you know, the, you know, each, you know, poetic language sort of, you know, being a kind of secret that has its own kind of codes and, you know, it's a form of expression in and of itself, right? Which is almost separate from the meaning of the indi individual words when they're brought, brought together. So it works on, as you're, as you're suggesting, like these multiple levels, right? And when Linton Crazy Johnson's case, it's like, it's the, it's the, it's the music. It's also the words on the page. It's the orality of it, how he expresses those words, right? And it's the, 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 the and it's the, how he expresses, how he articulates his own poetry, expresses his own poetry. And it's just the, 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 the power of the word itself, right? And particularly when it's a different language, right? That's in a different, that's in a, it's, it's a language that is not germane to the context. In other words, by choosing to write and perform his poetry in Patois as opposed to English, right? It's a political position. It's a statement in and of itself, right? And then of course, we talk about Lyndon Crazy Johnson in the same way that we, he talked about uh, Martin Carter, the great Guyanese poet, as being the political poet par excellence. So there's that other layer, which is, you know, which is what we usually emphasize the most is the political message itself. But the music and the aesthetic itself is a form of resistance because it transforms the soundscape of England, right? As it did transform the soundscape of Jamaica where, where, where the music has its roots, right? Because it was transforming a context in which the people from below for the first time, not for the first time necessarily, but, you know, first time in more recent times, right? Were conveying the moods, sensibilities, and aspirations of the people down below in a society that was dominated from above. And of course, Rastafari and the Rastafarian aesthetic have, have played a huge role um, in determining the shape of that music and the sound of that music. Yeah, there's a quote that I just copied down from the book where you say that um, Johnson is kind of confronting the condition of dread in the language of dread. But here you seem to be going a step further. And, you know, it's also the music of dread. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That Absolutely. And that's why I refer to him as a dread, a dread poet, you know. And, you know, that's in a chapter that's referred to as Kind of dread dialectics, right? There's this, there's this sensibility associated with Rastafari, even though Linton Crazy Johnson is not a Rastafarian, right? He incorporates or appropriates the language and culture in some of his poetry, right? Because religious or not, Rastafarian or not, you cannot, in Jamaican context, you can't not come to terms with the role that Rastafari the language of Rastafari, as Velma Pollard talks about, as dread talk, the language of Rastafari, the aesthetics of Rastafari, and also the position of Rastafari, right? As the most dispossessed of the dispossessed in Jamaican context. That's where that creativity, that's where that spirit that has taken the music around the world, that's where it comes from. And it's not coincidental that John LaRose, who was a major mentor, both politically and poetically, for Linton Crazy Johnson. You know, he has this beautiful article in which he talks about time and leisure time. And, you know, which is part and parcel of the whole promise that, you know, or the anticipation that with automation and all of these other things, we would have more time, you know, um, it's kind of, kind of taking it also from Linton Crazy Johnson's poem, poem, poem more time. We'd have more time for leisure, pleasure, pleasure, and all of these things that we don't have, right? But in, but in actuality, what we found is that automation has made us work longer, right? People spend more time on their more time on their computers, working at home longer days, et cetera, et cetera, right? But John LaRose flips that and encourages us to think and come to terms with how enforced leisure, as he describes it. The fact that there are so many people around the world who are part of the permanent underclass and the dispossessed, right? It's not coincidental in that forced leisure, forced unemployment, or forced precarious employment, that it's from there 
that the creativity comes from artistically, right? It's from societies themselves, even though the individual may be part of the middle class of that given society, but a society that has lived dispossession and colonization, and I go back to Jamaica and Rastafari, it's precisely from those spaces where this music and where this literature, and you think about the Caribbean as a, as a, as a, as a seascape and a land space, smattering of islands and has, you know, and this is not bombastic, but it's literally true, has produced some of the great writers in the English language of our time and also in the French language, right? When Andre Breton, Andre Breton first read Amy Césaire, he described him like all of these seemingly superlative terms right, as the greatest writer in the French language, right? When you think about proportionately, given the size of the Caribbean, the number of great writers that it produced, it has produced. You know, we think about fiction, you know, poetry, we think about um, Derek Walcott, right? That's the name that comes to mind because he won a Nobel Prize. But of course, there are just so many, right? Kamal Brathwaite could easily be that person, very easily. And that's just of that generation, the kind of romantic generation. You know, I think about C.L.R. James, another big influence on Linton Crazy Johnson. He writes his novel, Minty Ali, in 1928 in Trinidad. And it becomes the first novel published in Britain by somebody from the Caribbean. In other words, he opened that space for people like Andrea Levy, um, Zadie Smith, and um, who am I thinking of? Sorry, maybe I should be taking books off my show, but you know, I'm looking at this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The alley that just came out, right? Um, wonderful book. Um, a classic in terms of um, in terms of Caribbean literature, right? And Bernadine uh, Evaristo, right, who recently won the Booker Prize, right? She she makes reference to it as being such a foundational, important book, and writes the introduction to this new Penguin version, right? So Caribbean writers have opened up this space, hmm. right? Linton Crazy Johnson is a trailblazer in in many respects, but then we also have to put him in the context of Miss Louise Bennett, otherwise known as Miss Lou. Right, one of the first to consistently write poetry in Jamaica's national language and, and also theater. But then, of course, we go back even further to the 19 teens with Claude McKay, right, who wrote his first book of poetry in Patois, I think in 1912, in Jamaica, 1912, 1913, somewhere around there. So there's a long tradition of great writers, just as a, like a, long, a, a great intellectual tradition. And it, you know, it's part of how we sort of break or get away from some of the dominant conceptions we have of Caribbean people or people of African descent. And you know, I'll just mention one other place. You know, Haiti, right? Is a place of literature, there's a place of literature, right? It's not what people think of first, but Haiti is a place of writers and artists. And the love, you know, I've been to Haiti and um, I was there for a, a book fair about four, well, five or six years ago. And when you see the bus loads of people coming from all over the island, kids from schools, like converging at this book fair, right? Just because they have this thirst for reading and literature, it's, 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 something, it's something to behold. So, you know, Lyndon Crazy Johnson is just, is part of a bigger tradition. It's a long way of saying that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd like to um, I'd like to return to something you said about um, Edward Glisson and about kind of uh, poetic language or natural poetic language because um, another thing that I've really enjoyed from Glisson is this idea of um, poetics of relation and mm -hmm. identity as being something that's constructed in relation to each other um, but also the way in which sort of that that can that's essentially another way of phrasing conflict, right? Mm -hmm. And when you read Johnson in nation language, in Jamaican, whatever you want to use, Patois, whatever you want to call it, the, uh, you, you're brought into a question of relation between mm -hmm. the English language and, and the written nation language. Absolutely. So, you know, something, something you mentioned um, was, was, you were talking a lot about how he speaks it and how it sort of comes out of his mouth. And that's mm -hmm. something interesting. You, you, there's a discussion in the book about what is poetry 
you know, when when is poetry a living thing? Goes back to Derrida and language being a, a living thing. Mm -hmm. Going back to Rodney and history being a living thing and that existing in the language that the, the poems are written in. Um, yeah. But the discussion about when when is poetry truly alive? And this is interesting um, as well. But yeah, I was just wondering if you could go into sort of the conflict on the page as well as the conflict orally or verbally. Well, it's interesting, right? Because as you were as you were talking about Lisan's poet, um, um, poetics of relation, right? You know, it's out of that tension, out of that space of tension on contradiction that creates that creativity, right? And there's a way in which we can think about that in relation to Edward Said's notion of contrapuntalism, right? So what happens when you bring two seemingly disparate traditions, canons, languages, bodies of literature together and put them into conversation with each other, but as equals, right? So what he does in uh, culture and imperialism is he takes C.L.R. James, he takes a bit of Naipaul and, and George Lamming, Césaire and Fanon to a certain extent and puts them alongside these other bodies of work coming from the British context and says, well, no, these are part and parcel of our relationship, you know, Right, which we somehow have managed to separate as if the Caribbean exists outside the history of colonization, right? Which creates the circumstances, the tensions, which produces not only the language that the poetry is written, right? But the subject matter of the poetry itself. In other words, the whole cultural context is both authentic, right? But it's authentic insofar as it's a production of a relationship between the colonizer and the colonized. Right, which is why sometimes when we get into we hear these you know we hear these kind of conversations in poetry it's been in relation oftentimes to Derek Walcott in politics it's been sometimes in relation to C.L.R. James where there's this talk of well why are these folks so enamored with ancient Greece and Greek you know poet you know for poetry or literature or philosophy but the answer is actually pretty simple that was part of the colonial relationship right but what the bigger question is to what extent and how are those traditions reinterpreted, right? Creatively adapted and then thrown back out there into the world, which is precisely what Derek Walker does in Omeris, right? For which he won the Nobel Prize. I mean, it's like, you know, one of his biographers is referred to as a, you know, um, an epic of the dispossessed, right? He turns the whole thing on his head and makes it a Caribbean, poem and a Caribbean story. And of course, because it's a Caribbean story, right? That tiny island, which he's from called St. Lucia, which he calls something else in the, in, in the poem, which I can't remember right now, right? It becomes the embodiment and a particular reflection of all of the universal dynamics, all the history that produced the Caribbean, which is African, which is European, is indigenous, right? So the Caribbean in many respects is a microcosm of the world, right? And Derek Walcott, that's his creative adaptation. C.L.R. James talking about ancient Greece in relation to modern sports like cricket, you know, and his book Beyond the Boundary is really a work of great literature amongst other things in terms of his writing. Um, C.L.R. James explicitly talking about ancient Greek, ancient Greek democracy as a kind of example of how we can think about think about direct democracy um, is not necessarily how, you know, we're saying you know, if people want to kind of accuse him as sort of like this kind of, you know, kind of overemphasis on European models and traditions. Well, when you think about how he talks about direct democracy, really, that's not the model that Western societies have inherited, right? The political model is closer to Rome than it is to, it is to ancient Greece, where ordinary citizens were actively engaged in, part in a participatory model of, of politics. Now, they were citizens. They were also medics, non-citizens, slaves, including, and women who were non-citizens, right? So we understand that. But, you know, part of what I'm saying is that, you know, the Caribbean represents both linguistically, artistically, politically, and historically, this convergence of traditions. Right? And so that convergence of traditions that creates the Caribbean tradition in its multiplicity. 
And you know, um, that's not a contradiction or an aberration. It's what it is, right? It's embedded in the language. It's embedded in the politics. It's embedded in, it's embedded in the music. Um, in the broader American context, it's what produces song in Cuba. It's what produces the blues. It's what produces jazz. It what produces, it's what produced reggae, right? And um, that's been part of the beauty that has come out of the Caribbean, artistically, aesthetically, intellectually, and politically. So yeah, it's conflict and tension, but the beauty is the beauty that comes out of that, 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 that kind of cauldron, that, 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 that coming together, that convergence. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it, it, it kind of spawns, I think, another interesting question a bit potentially kind of tangentially, but, but if, if, as you say, the kind of Caribbean in, in the kind of political sphere is essentially the site of a convergence of, you know, a lot of other kind of um, political traditions. Um, I'm just thinking about the way in which poetry and Linton Quaith Johnson's poetry fits into that, because he has some interesting views on poetry. He, he sort of um, has said contradictory things in the past. He said that it's material struggle, not poetry, that, that makes a difference, that makes a change, you know, that actually poetry exists to give a voice to uh, the struggle and to the dispossessed, which obviously flies in the face of Amakal Cabral, who says that, you know, culture can be a tool of emancipation, come out Brathwaite, you know, tries to blur the lines or does blur the lines between kind of a creative act and a political act. And I just wonder where you fall down on that, you know, because I don't know Linton personally, but I've seen enough of him to know that he's not afraid of being a little bit contentious. And obviously this does go against sort of, you know, a lot of his political um, sort of peers and political allies. Where do you think well, I think that, first of all, his own poetry contradicts that statement. In other words, his own poetry has been a huge influence on politics and how people think and understand the world, much more so in some respects because of the medium of music, right? So I'm talking about especially his poetry as performed in public, sometimes in front of thousands of people, but also especially his recordings, which he sold in the hundreds of thousands. You go to South Africa, you go to parts of the African continent, across the Caribbean, you know, Germany, France, Italy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Poland. People are familiar with Linton Quady Johnson's poetry, right? And he's helped to shape their consciousness, right? He's helped to create that imaginative space of politics, thinking beyond the present, right? That creative space, in which you're able to kind of imagine human possibilities outside the circumstances in which we find ourselves, which is part of the beauty of what some great poetry does. And his poetry has been precisely that, um, reinterpreting struggle, reinterpreting how we understand socialism, reinterpreting how we understand and imagine human possibilities in a world that is in dire need of change, encouraging people to struggle, and at the same time recording that struggle. So I think, um, you know, his own body of work, his own poetry contradicts that statement, right? And yeah, I, and you're, I think you're right, though, because there's a, there's, there, there's a degree of inconsistency, because I think clearly he does understand that poets have played that role. He read W.E.B. Du Bois, The Souls of Black Folks, folks and I've encouraged him to write po poetry. Where did he discover W.E.B. Du Bois? It was either, I'm pretty sure it went through as a member of the British, British Black Panther movement, Right, where he discovered uh, C.L.R. James, and where he discovered, um, I think he maybe even read Black Reconstruction. There, E.P. Thompson's. Um, uh, I was going to say the condition of the English working class, but that's Engels. What's uh, E.P. Thompson's famous book? Anyway, well, it, it will come back to me. So, politics and poetry have been intertwined in his own life. He embodies that in so many respects. But it, you know, it's it's also close to that dichotomy that people make oftentimes between thinking and doing. But of course, we think in order to do, and doing shapes our thinking. The two things are interlocked. We can't separate them, right? You know, it's like, you know, when philosophers sometimes, it's funny, I was just reading this in something that Hannah Arendt wrote, you know, this idea that philosopher, philosophers can be sort of 
separate and distant, and they just think in this sort of stratosphere, and the doers are somewhere else. In fact, Hannah Arendt, in this particular case, was the one that was organizing it. When it's absolutely true that you know thinking, theory, and ideas, and I think there's a very close relationship between philosophy and poetry, and it's not surprising that ancient poets were considered philosophers and were considered people who philosophized, right? Um, that separation, you know, it might be a dichotomy within the person who sees themselves only as a poet and they have no role in social change, but what their poetry does often do is inspire social change, right? So what people do becomes the material, emb material embodiment of what the poets echo their voice in words. So I think it's, um, you know, he says, and it's, you know, I don't want to hold into something that he said in 1978 in the documentary Dreadbeat and Blood, but, you know, he talks about, well, he, he kind of he paraphrases this, this idea that, you know, you know, um, poetry doesn't change anything. I think it's absolutely not true. Um, and I think, you know, his poetry has changed the lives of many people. There are people that swear by his poetry, right? And drew inspiration from his poetry in, in times of dread and you know um, um, in times of destitution to use the word from Martin Heidegger you know writing through uh, Frederick Hodelin you know he was you know, you know the, the great German poet so I don't think we can make that separation I yeah I would I would I would choose to disagree with the great poet on this one <laughs> that makes you a brave man. Um, no, but you see, the thing is, I agree with you. I think it's an interesting thing. I think mm -hmm. it, it, it's sort of based on the assumption that, that poetry somehow exists in a void. You and I are having this discussion because of Linton Quace Johnson. Absolutely. No, that's that's his poetry, sort of, um, you know, there's a difference. And I'm not saying that this is a kind of, um, you know, going to go viral and, and change the world, but it's changing something. Something's happened. Sure. Um, actually, the, the kind of landscape has shifted, um, albeit kind of, you know, nominally, mm -hmm. you know, for our, for our festival. But, but that matters. These conversations are, you know, hopefully increasingly being had. Um, and, and he's been writing for such a long time, or maybe hasn't been actively writing, but his in, initial works coming out in the 70s have been around for such a long time. You've been teaching them in schools. That's a testament. <laughs> People exactly. are still enamored with his work. Absolutely, it can't, it can't have no. Uh, it can't change nothing because you know well, it's changed so both of us. I, I, it changed me. I evidently wrote a book because of him. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and then I suppose there's another question within this, um, within the sort of broader question of does poetry change things, which is that. I think I know where where Linton Quayce Johnson would come down on this, but there's this one of the first things you write in the book is that there's a sense of possibility, there's a sense of potential in his poetry. I think he might identify himself as a poet who records rather than who a poet who projects. He sort of writes what is. Uh, maybe in spite of or what can be in spite of what is. Do, do you see him, do you see him more as a kind of projector, as a, as a kind of hopeful voice, or do you see him more as a documenter, archivist, recorder? Well, he's been both. He's, he's absolutely been both. And I, I think there are a couple of ways we can think about that. So, as a young black person growing up in England, right, he had privy in terms of his experience, right, insight into the conditions and circumstances that black folks, and particularly those of his generation, were, were facing in relation to the state, in the school system, the police, neo-fascists, et cetera. Right? And he had a, a gift right, as an artist, and he was able to capture that. And that's, you know, artists, art is a form of insight, right? It's like that keen sense of being able to tune in and hone in on, on whatever and tap into the vibra vibrations of the moment in ways that those of us who are not artists are not able to do in the same way. So that might appear to be foresight because we don't see what the artist is seeing, but it's present, right? So it's insight 
that kind of disguises foresight. So, you know, there's a way we can think about how those early poems, where he talks about internecine violence, but then also talks about how that violence becomes externalized, like in Five Nights of Bleeding, for example. And one of those nights, you know, the so-called the so-called rebels, you know, lash out against Babylon. That is to say, the police, right? So they resist and they fight and protect and defend themselves. And he refers to that as a righteous war. If we think about how those poems anticipated what happened in England in the early 1980s, you know, when the cities across across England were kind of set ablaze because people just could not take like the pressure, they just could not, they were unwilling to deal with the pressure. His poetry anticipated that. Right? But also, as we look at it in retrospect, it captures that too. Right? He was sort of telling us in the early 1970s, the mid 1970s, well, you know, if something doesn't change, people are going to rise up and they're going to rebel. Right? He refers to them as rebels, like probably drawing from Amy Cazelle's um, poetry. He refers to them as rebels, right? They're not rioters, right? They're not violent for the sake of violence. And even when he talks about internecine violence in Five Nights of Bleeding, um, in Dread, Meat, and Blood, there's a kind of sociology to his poetics where he's explaining where the violence comes from, pent up anger, frustration, and folks lash out against those who, they're clo who are closest to them, right? That's a sociology. Just to add that comes some, from France, from France, from that comes from France, Fanon, I would say, among other people. Just to add some color to that, um, I was rereading my dissertation and I wrote down some statistics. It's interesting. Mm. So, um, 1981, there are big riots in Brixton, um, and the average uh, unemployment in the in the United Kingdom was 13 percent. Mm. Peak 1982 at 14 percent. In Brixton that figure was 24%. Um, among black people under the age of 19 in Britain, that was 55%. Um, and at that point, there's an incredibly young population as well. The, the black British population is incredibly young. Mm. Some of the top Sith riots in 1984, black male unemployment in Liverpool was at 80%. Um, so just to, just to sort of <laughs> butt in and, and give some color, this is the level of, of sort of deprivation and the level of frustration it's not um you know it's i cannot get work i can and therefore i cannot get accommodation and this is directly in his in his work and then when you when you add to those numbers right the criminalization of young black folks and members of the black population in general exclusions at school right or um the ways in which you know Linton Quincy johnson talks about it in terms of his own experience and ways in which Black students were channeled into special education programs outside of the main stream of the, the educational system. And you talk about you had neo fascist groups to that. You had, you know, racist teachers who would tell these students to go back home. Then you have Enoch Powell making these public utterances about, you know, rivers of blood and sending these people back where they come from. So it comes at these multiple levels from the mundane to the everyday political, et cetera, et cetera, from the micro to the macro. Of course, at some point, human beings, regardless of where they come from, Fanon was talking about colonial Algeria and other parts of the African continent. Linton Crazy Johnson sort of brings that to the to the British context. He also writes in his in his classic article, Jamaican Rebel Music, he talks about the same phenomenon in the Jamaican context. Under those circumstances, that's precisely what people do. They lash out, they respond sometimes in ways that we, of course, we consider unproductive because within the same group, right? But that's a, that's a diagnosable social phenomenon that you can apply to any group of people, right? So for example, when I talk about this in my, in my class, I often talk about, you know, violence in other contexts and Scotland comes up, right? And you know that for a long time, Scotland was considered one of the most violent places in the Western, in, in the kind of Western world, right? Not gun violence because it's not a gun culture like in North America. Right, and that, and then when you look at the circumstances under which Scottish people live, look at the rate of employment, incarceration, you know, you know, folks that you know who are perpetually poor from one generation to you look at all those indices that you check the boxes, right, and then you understand those circumstances in another context, like it be on a, on a state in Peckham, 
or it could be in the south side of Chicago or some part of Texas or Dallas, whatever the case may be. Those circumstances exist for a reason. And in his own inimical way and in the ways in which poetry with its economic use of language can do, that's what Linton Crazy Johnson was expressing in much of his work in those early days. The other thing I would say in relation to your question is that if you look at his poetry in the early 1990s after the collapse of the Soviet Union, while he doesn't anticipate it, right, in his earlier poetry, not really, or you could say that like about what about the working class in, in, the, in, the, in the, on the album um, Making History, or some of the other poems on it, how we talked about solidarity and various other things. But my point is that while he doesn't anticipate the collapse of the Soviet Union, he helps us understand it by implying through, through, through which party I would suggest comes from the influence politically of, of um, CLR James. One of the poems actually dedicated is a kind of elegy for James, the poem The Good Life, that, well, to some extent, you can celebrate the collapse of the Soviet Union because it was an authentic socialism. And now through its demise, it creates the space and the possibility for a new form of socialism to emerge, where it's not the singular Moses or the Vanguard party for that matter leading socialism, but the so-called each and every one that Lyndon Crazy Johnson refers to, ordinary people, right? Playing an active participant, participatory role in politics, which is precisely what C.L.R. James speaks about. It's precisely that example that we referred to earlier, where he, you know, he invokes ancient Greece, but he also invokes the Hungarian Revolution of 1956, and among, among, among other things. So, so there's a way in which, even when he's not forecasting or projecting, right, he's creating a space for us to think and imagine new possibilities when it appears as though there are none. Right? So it's about vision and conception, imagining a new a new world, which is one of the things that poetry can creatively do. And I think what links to this is a really because um, you mentioned Fanon earlier. And I think this is actually a cornerstone of the political aspect of his poetry, which is a um, fundamental understanding of the nature of violence. You know, you were talking about violence as being a diagnosable thing um, and how, you know, when a certain set of criteria are met, you know, it's an equation. Violence will then Ooh, take place. It's um, predictable and inherently part of the human condition, mm -hmm. psyche, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, something that will, you know, that you can be certain of. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, you know, those poems could easily be misunderstood in the same way that Fanon is misunderstood. You know, in the book I refer to it as, I refer to his invocation as, of Fanon as kind of phenomenology. It's like this phenomenology of violence that allows us to think about what violence is, right? And that under colonial circumstances or circums of oppression, that's where the inherent violence is. States are violent in that context. And the instruments of the state, the police, psychologically, the school system, all of those spaces that remind folks that they're excluded, even when there's not the use of physical violence. And of course, we know in the prisons, on the streets with police, there's been physical violence, there's physical violence too, right? So Fanon is essentially telling us, well, these are inherent relationships of violence, which then produce other forms of violence inherent within, inherent or, 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 or tied to the circumstances that folks who are colonized and oppressed find themselves living under, right? But then that fur, that, that the next stage or way of understanding violence is how those folks in colonial context, and it's like the history of Algeria, War of Independence, it's the history of the French Revolution and the American Revolution, right? Uh, it's like, well, internalized forms of violence or various forms of violence, and or, you know, we think about it in political terms, it becomes externalized, right? And it's used as a, Form of liberation. Fanon talked about it very explicitly. He's been and he's been described as a as a apostle of violence. But in essence, what he was describing was what, what was right in front of him, with the added dimension that he was a medical doctor and a clinical psychiatrist. 
So he recognized that even on the psychological level, how deeply embedded the violence is, was and is. So when, you know, in those early poems, what I call referred to as the blood poems by Linton Quigley Johnson, right? There's a kind of materiality to the violence, right? And it's also a kind of psychology to the violence. He talks about like, you know, the things bubbling up and boiling is like a volcano is going to erupt, right? And that tension is felt in the dome, in the head, right? And it's like the head is about to explode. So there's a physicality and a materiality that, that, that even comes down to the, to, the, to the human body and the physicality. So, um, but it's understanding that violence is a social phenomenon that impacts those who are dispossessed, marginalized, oppressed disproportionately. Right? And it comes through the state, it comes through instruments of the state in the prison system, on the street, by the police, it's psychological within the school system itself. Right? And yet, what we understand as violence is usually the manifestation of the initial forms of violence. Right? And that's when it becomes criminalized. And that's when people become pathologized and then incarcerated or institutionalized. Permanently excluded as well. Absolutely. And Absolutely. Unrehabilitated and excluded. Absolutely. And you were mentioning when you were talking about sort of, you know, um, the kind of physicality of violence, it, it just put me in mind of, uh, I think it's Brathwaite who said, the hurricane doesn't roar in pentameter. That's right. And this is, this is Johnson's rhythm, mm -hmm. lyricism, the actual technique and the technicalities of his poetry is Absolutely. It's in this completely. Mm -hmm. And a genuine, and a genuine, a genuine. I, I'm going to pause for a second. I'm very sorry. His poetry was a genuine eruption of its own, right? And he's describing the eruption also. And I should say, you know, because you mentioned Kemal Brother, and I know I mentioned him earlier, but I didn't mention him in, to, in relation to Linton Crazy Johnson. He's a huge influence on Linton Crazy Johnson. And in the book, what I there's a, there's a part where I think about his poem. Um, Kemal Brathwaite's masks alongside, interestingly, because the, masked po the mask as a poem is really situated within the African context in the West African context. Right? It's kind of like a, a kind, of, kind of mini epic poem about you know, uh, dispossession and repossession. There's something similar that plays out, a kind of dialectic that plays out in Linton Crazy Johnson's poems on socialism, which when you put the two side by side, you see you know, similar things or a similar, similar pattern emerging, right? Like death and decay and rejuvenate, rejuvenation or redemption, right? So socialism is redeemed because it emerges in this other form, right? Um, um, and there's a famous line, uh, not in things and times, in the revolutionary friend, sometimes the pungent odor of decay signals a brand new life that's on the way. Right? So out of the stench and decay, right, comes something new. It's precisely in that space where it, seems, where it appears as though there's no hope, all is lost, that something new can emerge. And this, this ties back to Glissant saying, you know, the Antilles of the Caribbean are a site of constant invention. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Most modern, creative, a place where people creatively create, don't just create or yeah. produce, but creatively create. Absolutely. Using the limited resources that have been you know, made available to the people of the Caribbean, right? And that's creativity, it's music, even without instruments, it's the voice, it's the use of language, which comes in the form of poetry and fiction, song, etc. Yeah. David, I think I'm just looking at the clock and uh, this is all we have time for, I'm afraid. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> no, David, I, can't, I can't believe it's 3.10. But, um... no, 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 honestly, honestly. Um, David's book, Dread Poetry and Freedom, Linton Quace Johnson and the Unfinished Revolution. You can get this uh, with a discount code LKJ30 and we'll pop that below on the Pluto store. Uh, do buy it, do give it a read because it really is... Um, this came out a couple of years after I'd finished my dissertation and uh, and it's 
it would have changed everything dramatically. Oh, uh, and it's just a fantastic, fantastic book. So go and get yourself a copy of it. And uh, thank you very much again to Pluto for sponsoring this talk. Um, and most of all, thank you to David. I think, uh, yeah, phenomenal. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> and thank you. Um, just a brief uh, note to end on. I'll also pop our Patreon down below. Um, so if you are sort of able to and, and would like to, then please do consider sponsoring us for things for the Zoom subscription uh, or, or for our artists and, and for our speakers as well. So, uh, so yeah, give that a thought and uh, hopefully see you at the next talk. Thank you. <laughs>